Working Cows Podcast, episode 241. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network. And this episode is brought to you by the Patreon supporters of the Working Cows podcast. A couple more weeks and we'll be getting some uh, get starting the process of getting some custom engraved cribbage boards made. If you're interested in that, you can support uh, for a one time per year gift at patreon.com slash working cows. If you give at the $216 $216 per year level or more. Uh, I'll be sending out those uh, custom engraved cribbage boards in the next uh, little while to those that are uh, supported at that level. Uh, been a huge blessing to my family. Really appreciate all the support we've gotten through Patreon over the years and uh, keeps the lights on here at the Working Cows podcast. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, be uh, much appreciative of your support. That also gets you uh, the coffee mugs and the stickers that go out quarterly and uh, access to the back library of bonus content, which is in excess of 50 episodes now, uh, or getting near 50 episodes, sorry, it's over 45 episodes now, and uh, really been trying to record bonus content with every guest. So if you're interested in that, head over to patreon.com slash working cows or check out the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 241. Workingcows.net slash 241 is the show notes page for today. My guest today is Ken Redman. Ken is a guy who comes recommended by Steve Campbell. Ken has uh, linear measured uh, many, many cattle and come across some um, commonalities among those herds that he has linear measured. And uh, we're going to talk to him about what is linear measuring, how is it used, how can the average guy use it, and what are some of the ways that they can deploy this tool with Ken. And uh, he's got some insights as far as many different herds uh, and seeing what cattle tend to perform in what way and how we can use linear measuring as a decision-making tool for uh, our our selection of good, efficient uh, animals, um, one way or the other. Um, and he's he's not a dogmatist as far as what we should be doing. He's just saying this is how, if you know what you want to do, this is how you can use this tool to decide uh, what you are, what target you're aiming at. As, as uh, Stan Parsons said, we don't want to hit bullseyes on the wrong target. So Anyways, all that to say, really excited to talk to Ken today about linear measuring. Ken, welcome to the Working Cows podcast. Thanks for joining me. You're welcome. Yeah, it's been a, um, I guess I've heard heard your name mentioned often in in uh, connection with the ideas of linear measuring. Who I think Steve Campbell was the one first exposed me to those to those ideas and uh, to the tool that is linear measuring. So I guess just kind of sh- start out with a broad overview of what is linear measuring. What are we talking about when we talk about linear measuring and how did it come to be a tool that was used uh, to to measure cattle? Well, it's a tool that certainly predates uh, anything that we're doing in the modern era. Uh, the modern way we're using it uh, started out when uh, with my grandfather, when we were coming out of the compressed cattle stages in the uh, 50s and 60s, and the biggest thing was that the uh, bigger cattle were out in the outlying herds that uh, typically didn't have scales, and he was using a heart girth and hip height measurement simply to determine how big the bulls were because they were looking for bigger, taller bulls in that era and didn't have scales on most of those operations. Uh, it evolved dramatically after he hooked up with Dr. Burl Winchester at Montana State University. And Burl brought a lot of uh, academic rigor to the table, and he had developed a system of measuring sheep that uh, they adapted to the cattle operation. And that pretty much was the genesis of the system that Steve is using and the one that I used. 
Sure. You mentioned uh, the compressed cattle phase. Um, is that, I, I think I've heard the, the term baby beef used. Is that kind of talking about a similar idea? Yeah, it is. Uh, there was a period of time back uh, quite some time ago into the 40s and 50s where they desired that, uh, you know, the cattle were smaller. They wanted to have your fat cover on them. And it was, uh, you know, they said that's what the market was looking for. I have pictures of relatives that were showing Hereford cattle in Denver that uh, you can see their belt buckles over the top of a two-year-old bull. And typically, I know my family was involved in the uh, uh, Hereford registered business, and they wanted them to the point that you could put your fist on the ground and tickle the brisket with your thumb. Huh. And you know, so that was a kind of cattle, and you know, it's one of these uh, cycles of the cattle industry. They decided that that wasn't where they needed to be. They got dwarfism coming into them, and it just went too far. And we tend to do that. We tend to cycle, and so we want them bigger. They get way too big, and then we want them small. And anyway, it's a cycle that's been around for a long time. Is there anybody that really has any idea what the, uh, the what the original breed was like? Um, you know, um, way back before. I mean, I, I suppose probably not really anybody that knows what it was like before human influence uh, as far as breeding selection of any kind. But um, you know, I mean, some of it's you're talking about this cycle of back and forth between bigger and smaller and and i think that the timeline you mentioned earlier was in the 50s when when we were in that those belt buckle cattle or you know being able to tickle the brisket with your thumb um was there was that cycle in response to a phase where they were breeding bigger and bigger cattle well the initial importation of the herefords from uh great britain indicates that those bulls were weighing right around a ton for not right around 3,000 pounds. Uh, those are big, big animals. And they were breeding them with the, the longhorns and others that were in this area. And I mean, that was the big step up from the uh, longhorn era of the Texas cattle drives and these sort of things. They were bringing in the British, you know, Hereford and uh, Shorthorn and Angus to some degree. But at that point, those were big cattle. I know I've seen pictures and this of turn of the century brown Swiss that were imported from Switzerland, and they were huge. They were over six. Those cows were up at 60 inches tall. Those cows were weighing well north of a ton. And so there was a period in time when a lot of those cattle were coming in from Europe and Great Britain where they were big animals. And then they shrunk them. And I'm sure that was to response to the environment because there wasn't a lot of feed being put up. Cattle had to pretty much rough it, uh, you know, when they were coming in. There's famous blizzards and, and conditions of the open range era that, uh, you know, there was a lot of animals that didn't survive it. Yeah, I've been doing a series of interviews with uh, guys in their 80s and 90s um, from my neighborhood and, and actually have traveled a little bit to do that as well. And, um, you know, I asked one of them who actually was a, a pretty famous Angus breeder uh, in his own right um, asked him about the early days, how the cattle got by and he, he you know, bef- and he's talking days before equipment, you know, and uh, st- he still remembers horse drawn equipment and all that. And uh, he said it was survival of the fittest. <laughs> That's how they got by yeah. survival of the fittest back in those days. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, my family background was in the uh, Southern Montana and the Crow Indian reservation. And, they typically wouldn't breed uh, heifers until they were two-year-olds, calves three-year-olds. And uh, the steers that they were selling uh, typically were three-year-old. They would uh, get them two summers and one winter. And those cattle forage, they didn't put up feed. Uh, sometimes the in-close ones got a little cake, but uh, the hay was pretty much just for the horses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and... I, you know, I mean, coming from the continent of Europe now, one of the things that I've learned uh, in the process of producing this podcast is that you uh, you get a picture in your mind about what a certain place on the on the global map is like, and then you 
come to realize that those places, uh, those countries are a lot more expansive, even though they're not very big on your map. They're a lot more expansive and there's a lot more variation. But coming from continental Europe, it's it's generally uh, a higher rainfall, more productive environment, similar to the eastern United States or the extreme western United States with the Pacific Northwest climate. So um, there was a lot more feed grown there, and they they, they could sustain uh, a lot larger animal. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the brown Swiss I was talking about, you know, turn of the century, they were really big. Uh, we're involved. I was involved in reimportation of them in the eighties, and uh, we went back there, and they had shrunk them dramatically and worked for efficiency. And those animals, the cows are two, fifty-two to fifty-four inches tall. They had a range that they called an optimum range, and it was for their deals. And those cows were weighing twelve to thirteen hundred pounds uh, dairy, obviously but they were triple purpose. I mean, they used them as draft animals. They used them as milk animals, and they also used them as a beef animal. Mm. And so for their environment that they had targeted, and they said they had been through, they had described those similar swings of deal, you know, that they had had smaller cattle. They went huge and got them tremendously big and then discovered that didn't work well for them. And they came back and they had developed an area that they considered their optimum and it was really the parameters are quite tight. And when you traveled across the country looking at herds to uh, buy, they were pretty uniform. And it would be what we would consider a moderate animal here. So, yeah, they've been through this. But, yes, they do. And, I mean, they typically live with them a lot of times. I mean, in mm-hmm. Switzerland, the houses and uh, livestock facilities were often the same building. Mm-hmm. They The house was connected to the barn and they... Well, we were looking at out on average about eight animals per per operation is all they had, and they took good care of them. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting history. Uh, you know, as far as the the tool itself of linear measuring, how is it generally used, or or maybe how is it best used in your mind as somebody who's uh, linear measured quite a few quite a few cattle? Well, there's a lot of things to be learned. Linear measures in of themselves are simply a measure. Uh, it isn't anything out of the ordinary to see how tall, how long, how wide, how, how big around an animal is. It's what you do with it, and that is entirely up to the people using them. And we had a bias on the people that I was working with in the operation that I came from that we didn't worry too much about the size, simply because... If the truth is, if you want to measure how big they are, put them on a scale that's far accurate than your linear measures, and it's easier and it's accepted. And I mean, that will give you a very good idea how big they are. What we were looking at was some other traits that were secondary to that, that were much more difficult to evaluate, characterize, and particularly dealing with uh, efficiency and reproduction. And so a lot, a lot of the emphasis in the way we were using linear measures was to measure the traits that uh, gave us indication about uh, reproductive and feed efficiency. What are some of those measurements? Uh, what, what things are being measured to tell you about reproductive and feed efficiency? Well, the, the basics of the animal, we have height and length. Uh, we also have circumference of the heart girth and rear flank and thickness of the hindquarter and, and shoulder. And from those, you get a, can get a profile of what that animal is and the general shape. Uh, there are people, of course, uh, that measure more. I mean, squirrel circumference in the bulls has been a linear measure that's been around the industry standard for a long time. And we used to have more measures than, than we looked at. We used to measure the head. We used to measure the length of the rump. We used to measure the depth of the thorough and a whole bunch of these things, but it turned out that, you know, more numbers didn't necessarily make it better. Sometimes trim it down and and make it more streamlined, easier to extract the useful information out of it. So those ones that you mentioned, uh, height, length, uh, circumference of the heart, girth, and rear flank, uh, I think you said size of the shoulder, um, you, those measures that you mentioned are the ones that will will communicate the 
uh, greatest amount of information related specifically to um, feed efficiency and 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 calving ease or or reproductive efficiency maybe is better a better way to say it we think so you know uh and again both of those traits are composite traits they aren't necessarily a trait in of themselves they are an animal's response to everything around them their genetics their management their environment uh all of these factors are all major factors that go into it, which makes it more difficult. And an awful lot of the time, the real value was setting up and enabled to make the animal fit what they were being asked to do. You know, I worked with in 17 states and two provinces in Canada extensively, and the, the optimum animal in Edmonton, Alberta, was very different than the one in San Antonio, Texas. Mm. And the one in Iowa looked very different than in the Mesa of Wyoming. You know, and so to a large degree, it was a tool used to say, okay, here, what were we asking them to do? If they were a seed stock herd versus a commercial herd, sometimes they were asked to do different things. The market was different. How they handled the cattle, uh, an awful lot of people in the area I was around sold at weeding. You know, I came from an operation where we carried them through and were carried them to the rail, and we took them to the rail uh, and marked them on the rail. And so all of those things will will necessitate a desire for a different profile, different animals. And you know, the measures is how you take that information and adapt those animals to what they're being asked to do and what you want them to do. Yeah, and that's really what I I like about this tool is that it's adaptable to every operation, and that if and and even from my operation to my neighbors, if I've got a goal of being able to sell off the cow, and my neighbor has a goal of being able to take them all the way to the rail, really, I think that's two different. Those are two different operations with two different goals, and probably linear measure might be a tool. Linear measuring might be a tool to uh, to help those uh, operations make some decisions about what kind of cow they want to keep around for meeting those goals. Would you agree with that? I would. Uh, but the primary one, it, in all reality, is, is that selecting your bull. Because most of your cow herds are fairly stable. Your turnover rate, you're bringing in a certain number of heifers. Uh, you know, it can be anywhere from a quarter to half of your heifers every year, you can make selection there, but the reality is the majority of them are going to be eligible uh, to go back into the herd. Uh, the changes you make are really going to be on the sire side. And it's a communication tool. Uh, it's one of those that, uh, you know, when I have a, a good friend that's down, you know, in, in Wyoming, or South Dakota, excuse me, you know, I, I call him and I say, okay, you know, what have you got? What do you need? And he says, well, you know, I'm looking for a bull and I need him to be about, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, you know, and he may be looking for an Angus bull to go out there on cattle that aren't going to the low input deal. And I have another friend that's uh, not far from there that uh, is a terminal cross operation. And, you know, there's a well-known Charlay breeder that's just down the road from me and he said I want you to go to the bull sale and here's what I'm looking for because I can't make it would you bid on you know some animals for me and this is what I want and he wanted a very different kind of an animal so it's a communication tool tell me what you want and we can do whatever you do in mm -hmm. of themselves the measures don't have any value beyond what they can tell you and what you're going to use them for and that is very personal mm. yeah that's good um would you say um, would you say that you you described earlier that the genetics, the management, and the environment is are those really the three components of a phenotype in an animal? And I think that maybe the one that gets left out a lot of times is the management that we we forget about that as being an influence uh, on the well, phenotype it, of an animal. It's huge. In fact, I don't know that it's the biggest, but it has to rank right at the top. Uh, because everybody has a different philosophy and a different resources to them. 
you know, I can use an example of, you know, our operation. We were a, a lot of farming and we had most of our crop were irrigated. Uh, transportation was quite a bit away. We were kind of isolated out in the Badlands, Montana. The cattle were a means to market our crop and the product we were producing on the irrigated rather than trying to market it directly and haul it uh, long distance in a truck, uh, you know. And so dad looked at the cattle as the way of marketing the farm produce. And so it wasn't, you know, we want to put feed through them because that's the moneymaker. And I put go to someone else at my in-laws that put up minimal hay and mostly grazing and they look at things completely differently and they should because it is a different operation, even though they're only, uh, you know, some distance apart. Yeah. So the, the, the bull is the biggest lever that we have. Am I hearing you right? As far as making changes in an operation, uh, if you're going to make changes in operation, pretty much the bull is the means to do it. You know, he's going to cover, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 cows in a year. And you can make changes in a hurry because a lot of the traits we're talking about are highly heritable. Uh, you know, my majors, that was what I did my master's work on and produced a thesis on just the parameters of linear measures. And we're looking at from 60 to uh, 80% heritable on height, length, width, and circumference. These are traits that you can get and you can change a herd very quickly because if I want them taller and longer, I can go get a taller and longer bull and those calves will be there first generation. And if I want them thicker and deeper, uh, it can be done and it can be done quickly. And it can be, if you want to make a change, it can be, it's by far the quickest way to do it. You know, uh, one animal can influence, uh, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 calves. Yeah, uh, you certainly aren't going to get that every cow. You know, <laughs> at most is probably going to have one, right? And right. So, so the impact on a program, you know, and also, anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I mean, like even even a cow over her lifetime is only going to give you, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten calves at the most. You know, and, and the average at cow the is probably a lot less than that. Honestly, the average cow is probably a lot less than that. So, uh, the bull, like you said, that there's a there's a big lever there that we can that we can make use of. You mentioned that you have worked from you know Alberta to San Antonio, uh, the Mesa of Wyoming to Iowa. Uh, what were some of the changes that you saw north to south and west to east? Well, a lot, a lot of it is the animal's response to environment and conditions. What it is is that up north, typically efficiency is the ability to handle, uh, to stay warm and to handle uh, cold. Whereas exactly the opposite down in, let's say, the Gulf Coast and the southern states where efficiency is determined to a large degree on the ability to radiate heat. And so you end up the most efficient animals in the northern climates uh, tend to be more spherical. They tend to be deeper, rounder, thicker, and uh, I wouldn't say smaller because a lot of those Canadian cattle are really big. Uh Heat is much more of a stressor than cold for most of them. And so the stress levels down south are actually quite a bit higher on an animal than they are up north. Whereas down in the southern cattle, you know, there's a reason that they have the uh, boss indicus influence in them. You know, they have the the looser hide, the uh, slimmer, uh, the cattle are a little taller, flatter side, you know, a lot of surface area per volume. And if you look at surface area per volume, a sphere is the one that minimizes surface area per volume, you know, and a flat rectangular is, is the opposite. And so mm. you find the cattle that way. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, surface area for volume m- minimized in the north and maximized in the south. That's a, an interesting right. way of thinking about it. What about east to west? What were were there any any things that stood out, or were it, was it similar things? Well, well the, the tremendous amount is, is you go into Iowa, you have limited sp- space for grazing animals. Uh, they're pretty much scavengers. They fit around the edges of the farmland. Mm. 
uh, the rough country, and these sort of things. And it tends to be a relatively limited uh, amount of space available to them, and it's lots of moisture and good good soil. Uh, so those cattle have an awful lot to eat, and shortage of something to eat is not really on their plate. And then uh, it's a little better now if you got the BT and the corn and, and some other things, but there used to be an awful lot of uh, winter grazing was on corn stalks and uh, crop fallow. And there was a lot of down feed. There would be sometimes, I mean, there'd be a lot of corn on the ground. And typically, uh, the larger animals there were more efficient. If you have metabolic efficiency, it's about weight to the three-quarter power. And if you run the numbers on that, larger animals will be more efficient. But it's a function of that, that growth potential to the environment that they're involved in. And if they have all the feed they can eat, uh, efficiency will favor the bigger animal. And then if you go into the country where you only have 10 inches of uh, rain and sagebrush is your primary forage uh, or out there, uh, those big animals that are really efficient in Iowa, they starve to death and die in a hurry. <laughs> it's not even in the ballpark. And so it's, it's adapting them to their conditions. And those can vary a lot, you know. I mean, we had that where we had we were using a, a group of bulls to breed cattle all over the all over those states, and it was a real challenge because there wasn't a single bull or even a group of bulls that uh, were best everywhere. So I think you said metabolic efficiency is uh, a formula of weight to the three quarter power. Is that right? Correct. And can you tell me about what, what that's telling us? Is What does metabolic efficiency mean? That's a, the efficiency in in taking in nutrients and, and turning them into uh, some right. kind of a... Right. If, if you were doing the feedlot studies, this, is, well, this would be coming out of feedlot studies, where basically the animals are eating everything that, uh, you know, their potential. They, they never go hungry. And they're eating reasonably good quality feed. And these, that was a number that came out of, you know, uh, efficiency, feed efficiency studies pretty much in the feedlot industry. And it's a general uh, concept. And what it boils down to is, is that, you know, given the abundance of resources, you know, it'll favor the larger animal. But if you have a limit to it, let's say you've got, well, if you used an engine, for instance, and you have a potential to produce 100 horsepower with a motor, and you have one that will produce a 400 horsepower. If you give it all the uh, fuel it can possibly use, you know, you're probably better off getting more efficiency out of the 400 uh, horsepower motor than you do the smaller one. But if you only limit the fuel that goes in to the point that it'll only produce 100 horse, then that smaller engine is 10 times more efficient or more than the large one. Uh, you know, it drives me crazy. I've got a, a three quarter ton pickup and I get eight to 10, 12 miles a gallon with it. And I drive a semi truck that's got 500, you know, horsepower in it, pulling 100,000 pound loads and they get 10 miles and 12 miles a gallon, which drives me absolutely crazy, <laughs> you know, but it's again, potential. If you didn't have the fuel to put to it and the cattle are kind of the same way, if you don't have the fuel to put to it, then you start favoring the smaller ones, and the more restrictive your fuel or your feed resources are, the more it'll favor the smaller animal. If you have all the feed resources in the world available to you, it'll generally favor the bigger animal. Hmm. So is there a balance then between the bigger, better, faster, and the smaller is better, or is it just a matter of in the West or in the in the less productive environments? You're going to want a smaller animal, and in the in the east, in the more productive environments, you're going to want a bigger animal, or even zip code to zip code. Is there a balance between those two things? There's all that, and then then if you add marketing in, and that's huge. Mm-hmm. You know, are you selling them at weaning? Are you taking them at a backgrounding them? Are you selling them at, at uh, you know five six months of age? Are you taking them and, and carrying them farther? And you know. Are they an animal that's uh, going to be required, you know, you're selling them as breeding stock or are you selling them, you know, for some other market? And, you know, uh, you know, my feedlot, I'm buying those calves that, you know, some either backgrounded or weaned, you know, and then I'm carrying them for X amount of months and then selling them on the rail. You know, that's a different market. And, but those are very real. 
and then you add in all kinds of other things. I mean, you know, the, the variables are really huge, but the measures are a tool and they're a communication tool and they're a way that you can track information from one time to the other to see what your responses are. Mm. it's really hard for your memory because you always are selective. You remember mm. some good ones and you remember some bad ones, but the big average kind of all blend together and it's really hard to sort it out. Yeah. So um, you said it's a, a communication tool. You gave the example of uh, somebody sending you to a bull sale and saying, you know, I can't make this kind of a bull. I need you to, to buy it for me. Uh, so walk me through that day. How does linear measuring help you choose a bull out of that ring? Are, are you taking a, a tape measure and a square with you, or, or is there something that you can see and compare ratios and say this is the one they're looking for, or how does that work? Well, you know, there are places that uh, just recently I'm not doing that much because I'm not in it. Before that, I would take my tools with me. And oftentimes they were prepping the animals for sale. And even if they didn't use the measures that those animals were enough that I could get a general deal of. The other one is when you've measured, you know, somewhere north of 10,000 of them, you get a pretty good eye. And, you know, uh, you can use references, you know, what the height of the panel, uh, the bar on a, a, a Potter River panel is, you know, and relative to them. And then you put the weight in there. You know, if I'm looking at the bull that's a year old and he's weighing 1,500 pounds, uh, I could take a picture of one that uh, I just did at the National Western a couple of years ago. as a client that we'd worked with for a long time before he even started measuring before I was involved. Anyway, he had a, a young bull that was in there that was 11 months old, you know, and I stood up next to him and did the hand on the chest. And then measured it, and it was okay. I got him, and this sort of thing. You know, he was a bull that was, you know, low 50s as far as height, uh, weighing 1,500 pounds. <laughs> he was thick and deep. And it was one of these, got pictures beside him, and, you know, you do the picture, okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways that you could do it. And, you know, the the simple fact is the eye is has worked for picking cattle for ever and it still works uh but it's really hard to tell them and you know you got somebody and you know i'm thinking a couple of herds mm. that i work with and they said okay you know i want to frame score three two or three bull you know it's okay that's the size you want that's what the you know the deal well uh you know frame score is another linear measure it's, it's hip height mm. you know so it's one of these okay i need a i would like to have a frame score two or three bull uh, you go, okay, that limits the parameters and okay, we can work with that. You know, and others that'll say, yeah, that's a little small for me. I'd like to round to five and it's okay. <laughs> that we can work with. And, you know, in the past, Lord's sakes, there were some really, really big animals. Uh, and there still is actually. Uh, how early on in the life of a, of a, uh, a beef animal, can you apply these tools of linear measurement and get useful data out? Uh, well, the first time you really get a hold of them very much is typically weeding. And the weeding parameters, to be blunt, are pretty sketchy uh, because their mother's environment is such a big factor in them. And they are yet to express their sexuality. And to me, the most important things that we look at are how their sexuality develops, the early maturing versus late maturing, the degree to which their sexual development takes place and gives you a pretty good indication of hormone levels and a fair amount of predicting as to how their reproductive efficiency is going to be for the rest of their life. And those don't start showing up and really spread them out to the point that you can tell them until they're about a year old. And then by the time you get to a two-year-old, a lot of times those differences have shrunk back up because, you know, the heifers are all cycling, the bulls are all pretty much fertile, and these sort of things. And so even the ones that may be a little late, they're there. And so the differences shrink again by the time two-year-old, and then as they get mature, you know, you're looking at a cumulative effect 
that could be there. And it isn't as diff. It, and by that time, we have a production record that uh, we can judge on. That's more important than measures by far. What are some of the ways of of determining early versus late maturing uh, when you're going to when you're going to select a bull? You have three different characteristics, pretty much, on a bull. You have the muscle development, uh, you have scrotal development, and then you have bone characteristics. And the most long term and most reliable is the effect on bone because it's cumulative. And where you get into it is is that the bones of the long bones that grow with the epiphysis, uh, the puberty causes those epiphyses to uh, close and the bone growth terminates versus the bones and then typically the leg bones are where we're looking at there. And that would be compared to uh, the bones of the spine, the length of the animal. And it really doesn't matter in animals. You can take a steer and castrate it at weaning or a bull and castrate him at weaning and you take uh, a mate to it and leave him in an intact bull. Their length really will be indistinguishable. It doesn't matter whether they've been castrated and never had testosterone in their system or if not, but Mm. the height will be completely different. That steer will be much taller than his bull counterpart. In fact, there was a herd in uh, southern Alberta that I was working with that had a breeding program, and he had two different marketing deals. He marketed seed stock that went to uh, the show, show ring, and he also had a pretty substantial clientele of commercial cattle breeders, and he produced two different styles of cattle for those two different markets, and he had them in the same herd, and we measured for several years with it. And I could have bulls in there as an example uh, that had exactly the same length at a year of age that were five inches different in height. Mm. And, you know, the shorter one had a scroll of circumferences that were up around 40 to 42. And uh, the other ones you might fit in the teacup. They were probably in the 35 and under uh, scroll of circumference. Uh, one had crest already that was pushing on his ears, and the other one looked like a steer. Mm-hmm. And that would be the difference is that a year of age, there could be five inches different with the same length. And the sex hormones, the earlier they go through puberty and the stronger the hormones level is, the quicker it shuts down the long bone growth of the legs. And you can measure that as a rel- as a ratio to the spine and it gives you a picture. And that relationship will be there all life because my numbers would indicate that an animal keeps getting longer till they're somewhere between six and seven years old before that completely quits and their length quits growing. Whereas the height oftentimes is done before they're a two-year-old mm. and that they never get any taller, especially in heifers. By the time a heifer is 18 months old, she's probably got all the height she's going to get if she's a fertile, if she's fertile. Gotcha. And so, and it's cumulative. And so if that doesn't change, they can be skinny, they can be fat, they can be well fed, they can do all these sort of things, but the bones aren't going to change. And, those are measures that aren't influenced by condition and circumstances. And so it's one of these are real solid, but they're also long in, in term. Whereas this effect of muscle can be very quick. I mean, it can change in two weeks. Mm. You know, a bull is bred down and, and he's gone out at the end of his breeding season and he's, <laughs> you know, thin. He won't have the muscle development that he did uh, two months ago or one month ago. And that is in the front end of a bull, the shoulder muscles, the crest, the neck, all of these sort of things. And they're quite responsive to environment, but they also measure it really quickly and fairly pronounced. You could really see a difference. So, you know, those are the things that go into it. Yeah. So my, my, uh, most re- recent episode with Steve Campbell was, uh, episode 233. And, um, we talked in there about a bull sale catalog wish list, some of the things that we would want to be able to see. Um, do you think that it's necessary, given the fact that the bull purchase is the most is the biggest lever that we can use to make a change in our in our cattle, uh, that it, it's necessary to go to that bull uh, breeder, the the seed stock guy, b- beforehand and say, uh, can I can I make some measurements and and look at these? How how are what are some ways that the 
commercial uh, producer can use this tool? That's absolutely possible. And if a guy's making a sale, he generally tries to accommodate the customer if he's, you know, if it will work for him. And, you know, I've found the seed stock producers extremely cooperative. You know, if you want to, if you want to throw a tape on them, fine. You know, as long as I got them close and can get a hold of them and it isn't going to interrupt my, my process of getting the bulls ready for sale very much. You know, and if you've got time, and if I'm picking something that I'm critical of, particularly an animal that is going to be move a herd and be very valuable to a herd, you know, again, we're talking a lot of times the seed stock operations, it's really critical to their success on picking a bull because it really matters, you know, how their reputation and so uh, the most one of the critical things I like to do is go look at the mothers. You know, is that cow got the characteristics I want in my herd? And if there's, you know, half a dozen bulls that I'm considering above and I look at the mother and one's got a tremendous track record, solid producer day in and day out, year in, year out, and her family line is solid. Uh, that gives me a lot more confidence than I go out there and you say, well, yeah, that was the best calf that a cow ever had. But, you know, you look back and she's it's the only good calf he's had, she's had. So, you know, there's other factors that go into it, but, uh, yeah, it depends on how much time and, and homework you want to do, you know, measure them. Absolutely. You know, look at the mothers and evaluate the mothers if you possibly can, because, uh, you know, that adds information to the deal, you know, the family history around them, you know, if it's typical, an animal is typical of the family line that, uh, he's coming from, then, and it's consistent over a generation or two, but that will differ than if an animal that comes in and is one of the most famous bulls in the Angus breed some years ago, and I was work, measuring for the guy that uh, raised him, and he's, you know, we were describing it and going out and looking, and he said, well, that bull was a result of a fire and ice mating. His, cow, his mother is really small, and the sire was really tall and rangy, and the bull came out just what you're looking for. But the result of the bull was, you know, he called it a fire nice mating. Well, he will be less consistent in his calf throwing calves than one that has mm. uh, had a consistent generation for a couple generations behind. And you can pick that up and maybe it matters to you, maybe it doesn't. But mm. all these are factors that go into the evaluation in addition to, well, it's the information gathering process. Right. You said it's a communication tool earlier on. Would you say that it's a decision-making tool or a verification tool? I'm guessing the answer is both, but w would you prefer it for one of those over the other? I like it as a ver as a, as both. You know, that's the obvious one. You know, it's one of those that a lot of it is you can, you can see. I mean, you go out and take a look at them. But you put a tape on and then you have a record and you verify what your eye is seeing because there's a lot of optical illusion. An animal mm. has got a lot of capacity that's got a thick barrel and thick. Your eye will make those animals, they will look short and dumpy to you. Mm. They just will. And until your eye has been trained to look through it and, you know, look at how far apart their feet stand on the ground, uh, look at other ways that you can do it. You know, you put a tape on it and then you walk them in a ring and those thick, deep volume animals, invariably, they say, well, they're just, they just lack uh, scale and they lack size. They're just, they're just too small. And it's, yeah, but they'll outgain the others hands down and the efficiency will smoke them. But uh, now we can't use them because, uh, you know, they don't have enough frame and it's, huh, put a tape on them and. We'll, we'll discuss it then, but hmm. you know, that's another side. No, I like that a lot. Uh, can you, um, can you walk me through kind of some of the, I don't know, is it ratios that can, that we can communicate to a broad audience, uh, as far as the things that will make an efficient cow and an efficient, uh, 
you know, this, this bull's going to produce efficient females. Um, is, is it ratios that we could communicate to a broad audience or how could we communicate to, to, to people what we're actually looking for when we go out and start doing some linear measuring? Ratios is by far the best because it's not size dependent. Uh, and if you're going just on the numbers, you need to standardize them. Let's say yearly measures. You know, if I go out there and I'm looking at a calf that's uh, 10 months old and I'm comparing it to one that's 14 months old, if you just go off the numbers, it's really hard to compare apples and oranges and make a meaningful uh, comparison. It's no, it's no different than the performance numbers where you have adjusted weaning weight and adjusted yearling weight, you know, and then average daily gain, you know. And so we're, we've got the same issues. Ratios can be independent of size and if you don't have those then you need to wait to standardize and i mean i had a system where i have the regressions and had formulas that i can standardize to a given size and typically uh, we went yearly because that's the the most typical when when decisions are made on an animal both breeding stock both heifers males and bulls or heifers and bulls but uh you know it's one of these i like for instance, uh, length, I like the height to be 40% of the length or less for early maturing animals. If I start getting the height at 42 to 43, 44%, I'm looking per- typically at a later maturing animal uh, that, from my perspective and biases, I consider them, you know, too late maturing. You know, I can get that down somewhere into the upper 30s, 37, 36, 37, extremely early. In fact, I've been in cases where we had, where it got too early. Uh, we started getting heifers that were getting bred before they were weaned. <laughs> and they were getting bred by the little bulls that were <laughs> with them on the herds. The heifers and bulls were breeding prior to weaning, and it turned into a management nightmare. Uh, as you might guess, and it's, well, we, maybe we took this early maturing a little too far for our circumstances. This is not a good plan because it's a train wreck. But, I mean, we did it in two generations, and we wow. got that animals that early maturing, and they were doing it in about three different herds, and then it's, aha, but we are a little too early here. So let's just back off a little bit because that's too much. <laughs> and, you know, I've seen them, but they were still growing at 18 months full on, You know, so you can go almost always, you can go too much. And that's the thing that I found in everything. Uh, You know, I I had a professor that was a wonderful mentor to me out of Colorado State that, you know, I was talking feed efficiency that we wanted these cattle to be feed efficient. And he goes, yeah, maybe. He says, let's go take a look over here. And he went and showed and he says, we've been breeding those, you know, for the better part of 50 years on some line breeding programs that we have. And we've been tracking feed efficiency for darn near that long with individual animals with a, a tag on them and it's measuring everything they eat every day. And he says, I can tell you this, this cattle right there are down in below six per, six pounds per uh, weight of feed per pound of gain. And he says, they are by far the most feed efficient cattle that you'll ever find. And I go, okay. And he says, yeah. And he says, they'll break everybody it touches. And I go, oh, really? He says, yeah, they're absolutely worthless. Uh, they don't want, they want to lay around and sleep. Uh, they produce fat real mm-hmm. easy. Mm-hmm. He says, the amount of milk that they produce wouldn't fill a teacup. Mm-hmm. He says, they'll starve their calf to death, every one of them. They don't get out. They don't forage. All they do is lay around, and they're the laziest, slowest cattle you ever saw. He says, the best feed efficiency you'll ever see. And he says, they're the most sorry excuse for a beef animal you'll ever have. And they break everybody that ever touch them. Mm. But he said, we do it for research to see what it is. So you can take it too far. And it goes all directions. And so, again, trying to find that sweet spot is what it's all about. And that sweet spot is somewhere away from both extremes. Almost, well, every time I've ever run across it, I haven't ever run across one yet. The, the extremes were the, the sweet spot for efficiency. Mm. So the 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 sweet spot is something that you can find in every environment for every business model 
but it's going to change north to south, east to west? I think so. Uh, but the worst problem is, is that it's a moving target all over. Uh, if you just took my home area right here, and I've got some good friends that have got you know their cattle operations, you know, right right next to me. Uh, the from ten years ago to the last to two years ago, uh, we had above average rainfall. Last year, hmm. it was horrible. Hmm. We had next to nothing. We were about a third of normal. And this year, they're predicted to be bad or worse. We're already extremely dry. And, you know, we may not even get much green up this spring. And the optimum cattle for those just from uh, six years ago to last year is completely different because it was, you know, we had a, a quite a period of time, several years, where we had good rain mm. and good forage. And then we hit this drought. And boy, I'll tell you what, it is really scary because, and you can't change your cows that fast and it really hammers you, but it's a whole different cat. Mm. Yeah, no, that's every year's different. So yeah, that, that the the target so, never stays in the same place. So you pick a target and you go there, and then you're just going to have to deal with it, right? You know. Yep. Uh, that's the unfortunate part is is that ever all our targets are moving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yep. Yeah, and it takes several years on a genetic side to make movement, uh, and the environment can change month to month. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, uh, yeah, very, very good uh, things to consider. It seems like to me, though, that you could probably use this even in purchasing uh, grass cattle uh, if you were trying to find the ones, if you, if you were wanting to, to have your grass deal on the gain, or if you were owning the cattle, you could use this for purchasing cattle that were going to be the most efficient uh, on grass in your environment. Um, is that too it would take too much of an individual you'd have to buy too many individuals to make that to make that work or is that something a way that it could be used it could be i mean there's opportunities right now where you have even last year there was a lot of cattle that were sold that were stayed there if the if they'd had feed available to them that were sold to the sales ring you know and yep. so i mean if you were an opportunist and you do it you can certainly pick there uh, but you may be in the same boat they are as having to buy expensive feed to keep them going because the grass just isn't there. But the other one is, is that if you're looking at uh, protecting against your worst case scenario, you're picking your optimum, you know, your average or, you know, an upper end. You know, if somebody's buying it and they're going to roll them in a year, I know I've got some friends that uh, buy uh, coal cows. And they typically uh, run them and they sell them within a year. They get one calf out of them and they've got it set up to handle it. And so, you know, they're looking at a short term roll them, flip them, you know, versus one that's going to be there and, and breed them and, and raise, you know, they've the herd's been there for several generations. But what it boils down to is if I'm protecting against worst case scenario, that's a whole different cat than I'm saying, okay, on average, this area where I'm at, we get, you know, 13, 14 inches of rain. You know, that's average. And so you, you know, on a big picture, you would target to try to optimize to those conditions. But you say, well, you know, uh, that's fine. But can I make it through these drought years and survive and survive as an operation? Well, maybe I need to back it off of the optimum and the optimum for that average and say, okay, let's, what is it going to take to protect? And produce when it's in the worst case scenario, when we're sitting in a, a, a major drought issue, will those cattle still survive? And that's a whole different thing because they'd be quite different. Yeah, well, I think you that's know, I, I think that's as much of a business model thing as it is in, as is as it is anything. That if we have a business model that is only cow calf all the time that exposes us to a lot more risk when a drought hits. Whereas if our business model is a, a quite a small percentage, relatively speaking of the animals that are here year round are cow calf animals. And then we're bringing in, uh, we're bringing in outside cattle to match the forage production. Uh, that becomes, I think a lot more or a lot less risky, uh, business model. Yeah, it is. And it's completely, 
you know, even though or right here in eastern Montana, you know, the home operation that I came from was near Gator Base. Right. You know, we didn't worry that much about drought, you know, versus one who puts up some wild hay and that's what they're doing. If they ha- don't have the grass, then they're purchasing it from who knows where and having to haul it in with the freight involved. They're a whole different, and yet literally they're a mile apart. Mm. Yeah. You know, and right. like you say, that's where I was talking about the management. The management is your business model, you know, and how you're handling them, what's your marketing, how you, all the resources that go into it. And that could be literally one mile to the next. And so it's really hard to generalize other than big picture concepts. You know, I want them to reproduce. I want them to be fairly efficient. And after that, the size and the marketing and this tend to be, okay, that's my management. What am I going to do with them? How am I going to do, you know, do I need to protect, you know, against certain circumstances or am I trying to maximize profit over average? You know, how much is the environment going to going to go into those decisions? So I guess, you know, as a consultant and an advisor, you've got a whole bunch of factors. Now, if I'm an individual operation, then that collapses deal and I can say for me, then it becomes much more precise and focused. Mm. So earlier you mentioned a ratio of 40% of their height to the length, right? Uh, yeah. And that's on the upper end. You know, you were talking maybe getting it down around 36 even and still being uh, kind of in that sweet spot. Um, are there other ratios that you found real helpful? I do. Uh, what is this that I like? Uh, I like it is just because of a northern bias <laughs> and most of the cattle I work with are you know cold adapted cattle I like to see the heart girth equal to the length mm. uh, you know and there can be very breed differences the old school now this is not the new cattle but the old school used to be the British cattle the Hereford Angus that was about the average their, their heart girth and length were about the same and versus you've had the uh, continental cattle that come in that, you know, Semitol and some of the other breeds that were similar to that, they typically were about five inches longer than they were around. And then you had some that were like Limousine and Solaire and some of these others that are 10 to 11 inches longer than they were around. And, you know, so those would be big picture some time ago. Now the breeds have flipped. <laughs> the reality <laughs> is right now the Angus are bigger than Semitols, uh, you know, go figure but and all of these are adapting uh you know i can get i've got some semitol cattle right now that have more capacity and thickness than any of the british cattle around here you know uh so again you can do what you want to do with them and you can take them where you want to go they aren't necessarily breed specific but that would be the general breed typicals you know that happened you know especially some years ago because my measures are it was quite a few years ago that i was doing it uh but i'm looking out the window constantly every time i drive through a herd of cows and <laughs> it, it's one of these i'm just taking my head and going hmm they're a different color than they used to be but darn they flipped it. they flipped mm. uh, you know the cattle of this color are what we decided didn't work very good for us 30 years ago and you flipped them and the other said oh well we found that those didn't work very good for us and we went a different direction and they switched places that's huh well they didn't learn much from each other did they (laughs) anyway that's me is that is that um height to length ratio and the heart girth ratio consistent north to south and east to west it's just that the shape as you mentioned earlier a more rectangular shape in the south and a more spherical shape in the north is is going to be the difference or do those ratios ratios remain the same it pretty much is uh the one thing that does come into it that is could be different is the ones that have the boss indicus the brahmin influence uh, typically are later sexually maturing than the Bos Taurus or the British cattle, you know, European-based cattle. And so you'll see that difference, and it'll show up that a lot of the, you know, the ones that have the Bos Indicus influence in them, uh, a lot of them are going to be a little taller, and they're going to be later maturing. And there's, you know, there's maybe some reasons for that, but that's fairly typical of the breeds that you're dealing with. And then, you know, we 
the one place that you can get, and the reason that I like the early maturing, is that you can break the pattern of mature size to growth. You can have growth early. If they shut it down quickly, you can have cows that have a smaller size and as a result, a smaller metabolic need for feed uh, that has the same potential for growth. You know, if you go weaning, which typically an animal hasn't gone through puberty yet at weaning, they're still just looking at their growth and the re feed resources of their mother. But I can change the cow size, oh, two to 300 pounds on mature size if they're early maturing versus a late maturing cow. You know, I can take a cow that's 11, 1,200 pounds mature weight uh, that has the same genetics for growth as one that weighs 15 or 1,600 pounds by changing the uh, early maturing versus late maturing. For me, that's a huge factor. Mm. Uh, you know, that early maturing cow that shuts her down and her growth stops, you know, at an earlier age, she simply will be smaller. It's it's really that simple. And but it does really make a difference. And typically, those animals are more reproductive efficient because part of it is, is that they have more feed resources available. If they're all out there grazed in the same pasture uh, relative to their size, that 1,100-pound cow is going to have more feed available relative to her size than a cow that weighs 1,600 pounds because they're eating probably a similar amount every day. Right. And the maintenance requirements on the larger cow is going to consume much more of what she total consumption is than the smaller cow. And she, the smaller cow will have more available for production, which is growth, milk, and reproduction. Yeah, if I remember right, I think Steve talks about there's five things that, that she's going to do. And I think th third on the list is is reproduction. She's got to take care of herself first. And then the third... Because the third thing she's going to do is start to cycle heavily enough to reproduce. And so if she's spending all this time meeting her own maintenance requirements, it's less likely that she's going to cycle uh, as strongly as maybe her mate that's a little bit smaller, a little bit more efficient. Absolutely. Are there things... You know, oh, go ahead. No, it, it's all it's a relativity kind of thing. You know, it's, it's one of these that, I mean... I favor the smaller animal in most circumstances, but I do know that there are circumstances where it is a huge advantage to be bigger. And, you know, I dealt with a lot of that is in the corn belt. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the corn belt, the cattle in the corn belt, it was everything. Economics, reproduction, the whole nine yards, uh, it favored the big animal, and it really did. And my gosh, I come out here in the short grass plains, and it's exactly the opposite. And those ratios that we've talked about a couple of times here. So the if if you start to get above forty percent of height to length ratio, uh, what is that telling you? They're going to be uh, more growthy Late. animal, or what? Are the, what is it telling you? No, it isn't. It isn't whether they're growth or not. It's whether or not how early they mature sexually. Okay. Because the sex hormones, and when they go through puberty. The estrogens in the female, the testosterone in the male, and it's not, there's, there's a whole group of them. I mean, it's not just yeah, right. one, yeah. but all of those, they, they cause the long bone growth to shut down, the epiphyses to close. And once the epiphyses are closed and sealed, that bone ne is done growing. It never will grow anymore. So the sooner that growth is shut down and the quicker it's, it closes, that earlier that, that animal quits growing in height. And again, the length and the spine is pretty much determines the size potential genetically. Sure. You know, if I measure the length, that gives me a pretty much the genetics for size. The height relative to that tells me how early they shut the growth down. Sure. Forty percent is about average. Right. And it. That, and that, go ahead. So less than forty percent is a earlier than average maturity. Later than that, typically is a little longer sure. maturity. Yep, and it shuts it off in the front in the cows, right? And then in the back in the bulls, is that right? No, both both ends, all the long bones. I see, I see, all the leg bones. Because I uh, 
where the, the, the muscularity changes is front in the bull mm. and the back of a cow. I see. I see. Uh, you know, the back, the back half of a steer versus the back half of a bull are really essentially indistinguishable. Right. Uh, but the front end is completely different. Mm. And the same way the cow, she develops the whole hind quarters completely different. And one thing that I will bring in, and it's one of these is just an aside, if you look at the ability for a cow to produce both growth, milk, and basically, if you're looking at weaning weights uh, relative to their size, and, you know, I've done quite a few dairy cows. In fact, as I was on a managed a parlor manager for dairy for a couple of years. Uh, if you want to measure a cow's ability to produce, the flank is head and shoulders drives all other measures. Mm. Uh, and the ratio between the girth and flank is probably one of your best predictors there is on the productivity of a cow. Is that measure of the heart girth circumference and the, the height right. of the flank or what's the, nope. what's the nope. flank measure? The circumference, of the, the circumference of the flank. And where does that tape go around that cow? Uh, basically, if you put it around there and snuck it up, it'll go just in front of the udder, just in front of the pin bones or hook bones. Gotcha. I see. Uh, and just snug it up just a little bit. But it's one of those that, on average, you know, a mature cow, you're looking at about four inches different between, you know, girth to flank. And I'm guessing four uh, inches bigger in the flank than the girth. Correct. Yep. Uh, when I get a cow and they're the same, I'm looking at there's there's a rat in here. There's a real problem. Mm. Uh, you know, either one or two things is going on. Either she's uh, sterile or not, or, or she's not functioning sexually. Or she's got way too much fat in the front end, both of which are generally negative deals. Mm. And if I have a, you know, for instance, I was heard that had both beef and, and is in, in Alberta. And they had a cow that had been the top dairy cow. They also had dairy. Uh, der- top dairy cow in the Canada for the last three years, I think it was. And we put a tape on her. Interestingly enough, she was the longest cow in the herd. And there was one or two that matched up with her. She was the second shortest in the herd. Hmm. Uh, she would, and her girth was big. It was almost equal to her leg. That cow was a hundred inches long. She had a nearly a hundred inch. She had upper nineties on girth. I mean, she was big, but she had a fourteen inch bigger heart flank than girth. Wow! There wasn't a cow. There wasn't a cow in that herd that was even close to her. She, that engine, and I've seen that in herd after herd after herd. The top producing cows are the ones that are going to have a lot of flank relative to their, you know, heart birth. And if I was going to pick one trait that I was picking on cows, you know, if you're looking at them, it's a side triangle. Those right. good cows are going to have that side triangle. That back end is going to be deeper and thicker. You can go from a, behind the shoulder or brisket to the navel extend that line down and you've got uh that triangle is well when you put the numbers to it that's probably the most uh highest correlation to productivity in that cow if you measure across basically everything reproductive milk growth all of it Hmm. i kind of want to just hit one last point to make sure I've kind of understood some of the things that you're saying. And, and one of the real aha moments aside from this, uh, this girth to flank, uh, ratio has been, uh, for me, you know, that you, you talked about that fire and ice pairing producing a less consistent, uh, a less consistent, um, progeny out of that bull that comes out of that fire and ice pairing his he, he's not going to have as consistent of a calf crop as somebody so maybe the 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 perfect scenario or the scenario that we're we're looking for when we're making those purchases is the scenario of uh the consistency within that herd and than some of these ratios. So we want to to buy buy these bulls from a place that produces a consistent output and then also has their ratios right of height to length, uh, heart girth, uh, and 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 some of those things uh, in in order. And then I guess the kind of the the final or or I guess the the cherry on on top of that would be that if we are 
approaching it from this way, would you say that it's possible that we could widen out the bell curve where we've got less calves on the low end and less calves on the high end and, and a more consistent calf crop altogether? Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, that variability is, is a big factor and our breeding styles have to do with that. I mean, it's the reason for crossbreeding. Heterosis and hybrid vigor tend to make it more uniform mm. and tend to uh, reduce the variability. And again, it's it's one of these, if you look at it from a big picture standpoint, almost all of our desirable traits are dominant and almost all of our undesirable traits are recessive. Mm. And the simple reason is if an undesirable trait is dominant, you get rid of it one generation. It shows up, you could say, I don't want that animal, it's gone from the herd. Mm. Boom, one generation's gone. And the desire, so almost all the time, you know, desirable is dominant and undesirable is recessive. And it's just the way it works out. It's, it's very true all across. And so when you do a, a mating, and obviously between breeds is one of them, is the crossbreeding, is, is that they tend to get the best of both breeds because the desirable dominance are there and they will cover the recessives that tend to be undesirable in each of those two breeds. And as a result, that's where your hybridization comes in. And, you know, it's the same in cattle. You do it in crops. You can do it all the time. You know, there's a real advantage to hybridization. But, you know, the other side of it is you inbreed it and you inbreed to fix traits and to weed out the undesirable. And so sometimes you want to get variation to be able to, if I'm a seed stock producer, and let's say I'm producing a corn crop, you know, you inbreed that stuff to get very specific traits and weed out all the others, and then you can put it back in that's more predictable. And essentially, if you look at the clay center data that's come out of their genetic evaluation studies that's gone on for, oh, Lord sakes, it's decades uh, or more, it's one of these that their deal was, it's a real enlightening, in one of their articles they said, Hybrid vigor is simply the recapture of the inbreeding depression that breeds underwent during their formation. Hmm. And so the seed stock producer inbreeds to fix traits and weed out the uh, recessives, the undesirable recessives, and the commercial producer recaptures that in the crossbreeding program because he gets the best of all traits and it tends to cover up the weaknesses. And so you can do that both within herd and without, you know, it's reason that a lot of people go for an outcross in the seed stock business. They may not be going a different breed, but they'll go for an outcross. Uh, you know, it tends to be produce some heterosis and some hybrid vigor, which tends to get more uniformity. And so a lot of us uniformity, the bell curve and these sort of things have a lot to do with a lot that dominant recessive, desirable, undesirable. And to get uniformity, typically you're taking a good set of dominance from both sides and it covers the weaknesses, which tend to make them more uniform, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think it does. And just to make sure <laughs> I'm making I'm making sense of what you're saying, um, you're saying that um, the, the line breeding or inbreeding, however you want to say it, the line breeding is... is the the way that that tool works partly is by compounding undesirable recessives and and when it fails when when line breeding fails those compounded recessives show up in an animal that doesn't that isn't going to work um, absolutely and the, the good ones you know as as Burl Winchester used to tell me he says a successful inbreeding program uh, the cattle you know the good ones get better and the poor cattle get worse. It spreads them out. He said the unsuccessful program, they all get worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was the line uh, from the Stockman grass farmer that I've quoted many times. Uh, when it works, it's line breeding. When it doesn't, it's inbreeding. There you go. <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you what, that is if, in the breeding side of things. There is nothing more interesting and more fun than inbreeding. Hmm. You, you can start figuring out what you've got and you can take them in places that you don't. And when you get the results, those results are solid and you're producing something that's actually different and it's really different. Whereas you take the ones that are the outcross ones and this, you can get cattle that look good. 
they perform good. But what they'll do in the rest of it is much more variable because they're coming from a mixed bag background and you've got the advantage of the dominance covered the recessives, but you never see those recessives, but they do show up again and you that's where it spreads it back out. You know, that's basic breeding theory, mm. but unfortunately it's true. Yeah. So the, the bang for your buck then is that long, long-term uh, program of line breeding and then bringing in that outcross, even if it's within with, within the same breed, bringing in that outcross, uh, that that pairing is going to give you the, the greatest bang for your buck. Is that right? Yeah, it's the, it's the basis behind uh, crossbreeding. Right. You know, there's a reason that the, the commercial people crossbreed, and it, the bang is even better uh, if uh, the inbred. If you right. if you get sire from a program. And he's what you want. But the problem is it takes a long time to do that. And it's really hard to make fast changes. And so it's one of these to find what you're really looking for in a program that's got, you know, four or five generations of cattle bred for a very specific purpose and tightened up. It's hard to find those cattle and you may not be able to afford them. (laughs) But if you do, if you do, oh, Lordy, if I can go to an operation and I go there and it's about four to five generations behind it and they've tightened them up and the pedigrees are tight and those cattle are there, I can have pretty good confidence. I'm going to get what I sh- I'm looking at hmm. and, and then, I will get a heck of a bang coming out of it because I'm going to get more hybrid vigor than is this in uniformity. Oh, Lordy, this is perfect, Yeah, but hard to find. <laughs> and then is it predictable? Is the result predictable? More so. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Absolutely. Very good. Well, Ken, you and I could talk for a long time about this, uh, but you had mentioned earlier on a master's thesis. Is that available somewhere where people could get a hold of it and, and read it? The, the title on that thesis is The Genetic Parameters, Linear and Performance Measures in Semitol Cattle. Ken, did we miss anything today? I mean, there, we covered a lot of territory. We could obviously go a lot farther, but is there any, any big ticket items that you had on your list that you wanted to cover today? Like you say, it, it, it's kind of like a, a circle. If you, if you take a dot on a white piece of paper and you let that represent your knowledge, the white that's out there, this is what you don't know. It's as you expand the knowledge, the, cir- the amount that you don't know, the, where the circle touches the, the dot touches the white, keeps getting larger and larger, and it's you know uh, pi d. So for every unit of uh, increase in knowledge, there's three times more that you realize you don't know, and it kind of works in all these subjects. You start out with a small and summary, and then as you expand each one of them, there's more and more detail in every single component, and how they all start working together. It's in play, and it, it as it grows, it gets more complicated. You know, I mean, Steve and I can sit and talk constantly for over a weekend, and be two or three days, and there's more to talk about when we get done than when we started. Yeah, yeah. No, I can definitely see just, you know, in the dots that I've been trying to connect here uh, today that that would definitely be the case. So uh, I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate your, your approach and, and the way that you've communicated it today. Ken, thank you. Well, if it could be useful to someone, I'd uh, enjoy that. Very good stuff there with Ken. Really appreciate his time and uh, really appreciate um, him sharing his wealth of information uh, with me. Really looking forward to uh, the next episode of the Working Cows podcast. And coming up next week uh, on the Working Cows podcast, we will be talking with Amanda Radke. She's got a new book coming out. She's been writing some really great uh, children's books about agriculture. We're going to talk to her about a few of those, but she has one that is releasing next week, actually, on the day that this episode releases with her, her book uh, on um, faith freedom and farming will be uh, will be released on that day. So really Really looking forward to sharing that with you on Memorial Day. Uh, We will see you again real soon. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.